Welcome everybody. My name is Izzy Fuqua. I'm the adult programs coordinator for the VMFA and I get to work with wonderful colleagues like Dr. Leo G. Mazo, the uh, Louise B. and J. Harwood Cochran Curator of American Art. Uh, to deliver these monthly gallery talks. Um, the 3 and 30 is offered the first Tuesday and Thursday of every month. Uh, so Leo actually persevered through a fire alarm on Tuesday and delivered a wonderful talk in the third floor photography gallery just next to a muse um, where this exhibition is currently on view. So now Leo is going to deliver it virtually for you um, this morning. Just a couple of reminders about the format of the virtual 3 and 30. Leo will talk for approximately 20 minutes and then we'll spend the rest of the time of 10-ish minutes in conversation or uh, Q&A with you, the audience. So with that, Leo, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everybody advertising because in fact while I there one should do just three works in a three and 30 and there are three dominant works here this is not one of them there's a larger context I think that it's appropriate to give for John Covert because um, most people have not even heard of this this guy so I just want to say that his life dates are 1882 to 1960. He was a frequent and active participant in the salon-like gatherings held at the apartment of the preeminent modern art patrons, Walter and Louise Ehrensberg, at 33 West 67th Street, where, in the late 1910s, a New York version of Dadaism that um, iconoclastic, anarchic, modern art movement largely transpired. Dada had epicenters in London and Zurich and Hanover and a number of places. This is important, and, and you're looking here at the actual apartment of the Walter and Louise Ernsberg. Walter Ernsberg, you see at the left, was at the time the preeminent collector of modern, not just modern American, modern art. He in fact owned, as you can see here, Marcel Duchamp's New Descending the Staircase that you've probably heard about for the scandal that it caused at the Armory Show in 1913. Um, the so-called Orangeburg Circle boasted of such luminaries as Albert Glaze, Francis Picabia, Man Ray, Charles Sheeler, and Beatrice Wood, and John Covert himself, the Baroness Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven, uh, Charles Demuth, Charles Sheeler, but in the privileged confines of the Arnsberg ap apartment, um, there is a manifestation of Dadaism that was part hedonistic party game, part salon in the old school 18th century Madame du Pompadour style. Um, but John Covert participated in this. He was Walter Ehrensberg's first cousin. If he had not been Ehrensberg's first cousin, we might not know of him. Ehrensberg is from the Pittsburgh area and he studied in Pitt Pittsburgh and then wound, wound up um, at um, the Munich School of Art. Uh, a lot of other artists had studied there, such as the still life painter, William Michael Harnett, the European surrealist, Giorgio de Chirico. And many years ago, I myself curated an exhibition um, on John Covert's work. Uh, called John Covert Rediscovered. And a friend of mine, a year or two younger than myself, named Michael Taylor, is who I went to. And I asked him if he would write one of the catalog essays because he was known then, as he's known now, as one of the internationally known Dada scholars. And on and he he's probably the most highly esteemed scholar of Duchamp and Man Ray alike. Uh, and so it made sense and I went to him. When he and I, when he came 
by luck, some good luck and some good circumstance, when he and I both came, he came to VMFA in 2015. I came a year, year and a half later, um, the summer of 2016. We began talking about our friends, the descendants of Walter and Louise Ernsberg, who had lent us both um, a number of, um, they had lent to my exhibition a number of works and who he knew at least as well as I did, that's for sure. And so we worked with the descendants of Louise and Walter Ehrensberg, uh, their great nephew in, per, in particular. And first they gave us several, they gifted us, just gave us several painting, paintings, such as Yellow Mountains, which you see on the right. And then at a later date, they, we bought from them, uh, from a dealer, but from them at a very reasonable rate, uh, Coverts, I don't know if they're more important, but Covert made a very important contribution to the history of uh, early 20th century and World War I era photography. Now, when you put together the drawings and paintings that the Ehrensberg family gave us and the photographs that we purchased a year or two later, which would be a year or two ago now from the 2022 standpoint, about a year ago, we now join the other museums that are studies centers for the study of this wildly important 19th, uh, 20th century American artist. The other places where you will see a lot of his works on the wall are the Seattle Art Museum, MoMA, the Whitney, not bad com company to, to keep, but especially the Yale University Art Gal Gallery. Uh, what we now are able to do is we are able with photographs like Study for Yellow Mountains, we're able to understand how literally and, and in what a forthright manner um, Covert relied on his photographs for a nascent abstract style. On the one hand, this is a very academic painting. It shows the figure, you know, the nude figure um, in, you know, which is the kind of thing you would do in a class, hence the phrase academic painting, but look at the abstract back, background. Look at the summary treatment of her body. There's a creeping sense of abstraction here. So we're able to give his career a little bit of context. Um, another photograph that we have is a series of photographs for a religiously inspired work called I Am That I Am, which has um, a long biblical ba basis, uh, a very creepy a lot of these works have a strangeness to them if, as long as i'm being a little judgy here uh the work on the right i suppose wouldn't be so creepy if she only had a head um but we see the reason i don't want to dwell on this for too long because there's a larger point in all of this but we're able to give a bit of context modernism is often about artistic experimentation i mean you wouldn't look at this to learn about flowers or how people hold their arms together. Um, it is a bit of an academic exercise in that bit, but you don't really, you know, this isn't a portrait of anybody, but look carefully at the work on the left and now look, look at it. Because of the suite of studies that we have for canonical works like I am that I am, we're able to lift our heads up, so to speak, like the model does, I guess, and see him uh, from, in a more holistic, a more uh, realistic way. So um, there's a thing to be said about his, um, about his photographs. So these prints alert us to Covert's use of photography from 1916 to 1923. And-, yes. and and that's my dog. They alert us to Covert's use of photography from 1916 to 1923, the key years of New York Dada. In advance of figurative works, still lifes and abstract composition, Covert probably produced about 250 uh, photo photographs, which are now in the museums I mentioned. Most of these are multiple studies of a single figure in the, in the artist's studio, often in preparation for a painting, as you can see here. 
but he also photographed um, wooden dolls, related toys as studies, um, often in advance of paintings. Covert though is probably best known, however, as an administrator of modernism. Some of you may have heard the story of the Society of Independent Artists who in 1916, 1917, put out a call for entries for an exhibition, but it was different than other exhibitions that we would have a call for entries for. The call for entries said that all works will be exhibited. Well, anyone, anything you, I could submit my cup of coffee and it would be in the show. But what, Marcel Duchamp wondered, what about a ceramic urinal, put it upside down and call it a fount fountain? So Covert was at the middle of all of this. Covert was the custodian curator of this, of this group. Um, and he wrote the call for entries that caused this whole con controversy. He was also um, the first artist to contribute works to a modern, a wildly important modern art group called the Societe Anonyme. Catherine Dreyer tried to get him to be the curator of this, but he was too busy as an artist. The Societe Anonyme, um, it's kind of like an art support group, a library. Uh, it was an amazing collection. Here's a major Man Ray called Tu Um. Here's Marcel Duchamp's Bride Stripped Bear by the Bachelors, even otherwise called the Large Glass. But what Covert did in at Catherine Dreyer's request, he gave six paintings to, to start the collection. And that collection, these are two of, and, and this shows that Covert made his name as an assemblage artist long before other artists were doing assemblage i.e. affixing wires and wooden dowels and upholstery tacks, all of which you see in these works. Some of, I'm sure many of which are on, these are all at Yale now. I'm sure several, most of these are on view. Um, uh, he gave these to, to her to start this collection. Um, and she wrote a survey and she made a very interesting comment. She said, of all the Americans, this is her survey book called Western Art in the New Era. She wrote, John Marin is the most complete. I don't know what that means. Uh, I love John Marin's watercolors, but John Covert is the, among the most gifted in his research work. And I wondered what the heck that might mean. So when you look on his taxes, and a lot of this is pres preserved at the, um, Philadelphia Museum of Art Library Archives. When you look on there, so Dreyer had said he was a researcher. He claimed his cousin, um, Walter Ehrensberg, as his employer. And as you can see there, W.C. Ehrensberg. And he gave his, he didn't think of himself as a, he said he was an artist, but he said that his work, his occupation, in fact, was research work and writing. So this is not your average artist, right? And these are not your average photographs. Um, for all their differences in model, pose, comportment, these works show John Covert's keen investment in the expressive possibility of the human figure. None of, only a handful of his paintings and none of his female, and no photographs of the female nude were exhibited in his life lifetime. Now, American photographers like Edward Steichen and Alfred Stieglitz have certainly uh, photographed nudes, but were someone like, if you've seen Stieglitz's photographs of Georgia O'Keeffe, they box off parts of her body, her thighs, um, her chest, her legs, her hand. Um, Covert's a little diff different. They, his photographs take bold steps in um, presenting women uh, in ways that suggest a liberated sense of self, moving in three dim dimensions, not afraid to smile and to be called in a vernacular moment. These works don't crop out body works and elbow room is a plenty. One of the weird things about these photographs 
And what makes him truly, a, perhaps this makes him a Dada photographer, is that see, in order to get experimental effects, people like Stieglitz, uh, so-called soft focus pictorialist photographers, um, like F. Holland Day, um, Steichen, Edward Steichen himself, they experimented in order to elevate photography to be on a par with painting, they try to get painterly effects through manipulating development processes, um, manipulating film, writing on film, uh, applying things to film. Um, but Covert's models, conversely, apply some very strange, slightly disturbing uh, substance, greasy substance to their body. And what this does, what that substance does is it highlights the contrast between light and shade. And that is why, that is why, you know, as you can see in these works, he's interested in the, maybe not chiaroscuro, the, the harsh contrast of light and shade, but he's interested in offsetting, uh, you know, he's interested in, in suggesting a credible illusion of space going to the picture plane and convincingly rendering the human figure. That's why these models have this substance upon, upon them. So he does his models due to their own flesh, in a sense, um, the kind of manipulation that's done with film by other artists. John Covert used an Autograflex junior cam camera. This is the actual camera that he used in advance of all these photographs. He knew what he was doing. He, um, you know, he knew how to stage the scene and he certainly knew a good bit about photography. And here you see almost a, you see the figure in motion. Even when we don't see two figures here, we see an individual caught in the middle of a dance, a motion. And in fact, Covert knew a lot about film and motion picture. And one of the things that probably Im impacts this, during World War II, John Covert worked for the Division of Films of the Committee on Public Information and did such a great job on this that he was presented with this certificate. He got this certificate for analyzing films, probably from a propaganda point of view. The point of all this is that he brought a filmic photographic sen sensibility to the artist studio and to his artistic practice and even to his work for this propaganda organization that had been the Committee on Public Information called the CPI that had been um, created by President Woodrow Wil Wilson in support of uh, domestic efforts during World War I. He probably borrowed when, during these intense years of activity for the Com Committee on Public Information. He probably was influenced a little bit by that. I mean, a lot of the works had to do with time and here he has a, his most famous work is called Time. And in place of the steeple, you have the intersection of these rays and you have the four repeated there. Um, he also long before other artists were doing what I find very just, I mean, I guess there's nothing really controversial. But, I mean, a doll in its own right, except when you take the garb off of a simple wood or bisque doll, um, it's just, you know, a strange type of theatricality with especially foreboding shadows. So he has a lot of these works and we have these two photographs in the, in the exhibition too. And again, the doll series was also in advance of um, a painting. This work, one of his doll paintings is in the uh, uh, Seattle Art Museum. So, John Covert was well known as an administrator. Um, he facilitated perhaps the most controversial artistic episode in early 20th century America, the whole uh, 
scandal of Marcel Duchamp's fountain. Um, he worked with uh, Catherine Dreyer on this. He, his, his artwork helped found the Societe Anonyme collection, which is a lot of canonical works are there. And you know, a lot of, a lot of art museums have this, this stuff, but this stuff typically stops around 1923. Why is that? Well, it was tough being a modern artist in the early to mid twenties. Um, a lot of the European emigres who had provided the camaraderie and fun, uh, the, the party game atmosphere of the Dada salons at the Arnsberg's apartment, they, they bolted after the war or they stayed, but the moment was gone. Um, Marcel Duchamp ends up going to South America for a while. Uh, the Arnsbergs themselves would soon move to California. And he, during his time as his productive years as an artist, 1914, 15 to 1923, he only had one major exhibition. It was a major show, but that was it. Stieglitz, he told a later commentator, a lot of young art historians would go and find, find him. I know someone who met him, actually. Uh, he lives until 1960. And um, he said, you know, he reflected on the fact that there was nothing to eat. Not even Stieglitz would show these at his uh, ga galleries where he showed photography and modernist European and American painting. Um, so he realized there was happiness with the time limit on it. So he closes his studio in 1923. And a lot of people thinks that a lot of people think that that's where the John Cover story stops. I'm not so sure. From 1923 until shortly before his death in 1960, John Covert worked for his cousins, Frank Arnsberg and family. They owned the Pittsburgh based Vesuvius Crucible Company. What a crucible, this big cauldron that, you know, metals are processed, raw materials are given form processed, and he sold parts in conjunction, probably because the Arnsbergs knew that he was a problematic guy. We could spend a whole hour just talking about certain psychological challenges that he, that he had, either on his own volition or because he was requested to do so by the Arnsbergs. He kept these amazing day books, writing in a code. Um, I think I know how he did the code. I, I can't translate it though. And with all these different calligraphic symbols and brightly colored, is it so different from the art he was doing earlier? I don't know, but I'll tell you what else he did. He continued making art. A lot of, um, a lot of Dadaism banked on word pun. Think of Marcel Duchamp's later, um, think of his um, persona, Rose C'est la vie, or Eros, that's life. So here we have a guy named Mr. E, uh, which becomes Miss Mystery. Here we have um, Miss Terry, Mystery. Here we have another calligraphic abstraction. Uh, we now have these works on paper as well here at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And, and I would say that John Covert is even, he wasn't just a modernist before his time, but he was something of a minimalist before his time as well. That's all I have to say. Um, you're welcome to uh, pose any, any questions here and maybe I'll be able to answer them. So thanks so, so much. Thank you, Leo. That was great. Um, you know, something that's nice about the virtual events is we get to see a couple more images that aren't always possible to bring in to the in-person experience. So thank you for um, sharing that. We did have a question actually about the, the doll photos. Um, like you said, they can be a little bit disturbing. Um, and you mentioned Dali and these figures that Covert was surrounded by. Um, was there any sort of timeline between Covert and Dali? These just feel very surreal, I guess. And, and maybe something that Dali would have been informed by or maybe Covert was inform informed by Dali. Is there any sort of exchange going on there? If Salvador Dali had ever heard of John Covert, I don't know that he would ad admit it. Okay. Uh, late in life, Man, Man Ray was interviewed and someone said something to him like, uh, 
and John Covert, as you know, was also an important force in modernism. And Man Ray's comment was says was, "Okay, if you say if you say so." Oh no! <laughs> yeah, don't 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 try it on anybody. It's it's a like somewhere between passive aggressive. Well, might just you know, you know, you know what he really thinks. I don't know that Salvador Dali saw this, but I can tell you that um, Covert has figured in virtually all major exhibitions. Of both American, definitely American, and some New York data. Even this gigantic show about 15 or um, 15 or 16 years ago at the Na National Gallery, simply called Dada. Um, I don't know that individual artworks, uh, you know, these, if anything, anticipate the even, I would say, even more disturbing doll images by Han Hans Bel Belmer. I think Covert's ahead of his time. I think that, um, you know, Duchamp said something really interesting about him, something about, I wish Michael T Taylor was on this call because he would know the exact quote, uh, that the, the artist of tomorrow will go underground. Meaning that we don't always know a, a great artist when we see one. And Covert was really ahead of his time. So I'm not sure Salvador Dali knew him. I think he was pushing the, en the envelope. But I will, I will tell you that as early as 19, as the late 50s, early 60s, um, museums, like the Dallas Museum of Art features him in a, in a, in a, as part of a series of exhibitions. So he's on people's radar. I don't know that he was on Salvador Dali's radar, but I think it's absolutely on the money to say that this is a great example of how you can be surreal without wearing surrealism on your sleeve. Absolutely. Be, being in, tapped into that concept. Um, thank you. Another question that came in was um, regarding the, the, the nude um, picture that you showed in the beginning, um, study for yellow mountains. Someone is maybe making a connection to Ong, um, the reclining figures that he did. Do you know if there's any connection there about maybe his study? Did he look at Ong at all? Um, I have never heard that but I'm not sure that's off the mark either though. Okay. Because when you call someone an academic painter and here he's trying to insert a dose of abstraction into a rather conservative study. Studying the nude is like studying, you know, doing exercises in figure painting or figure drawing or photography. It's like learning linear perspective. It's just a tool of the trade. Mm -hmm. But being an academic artist in the academy you don't just learn how to do linear perspective and capture muscle groups. You also learn the, his, the history of art. And, um, you know, I think that Ong, uh, Velasquez, think of the Royal Could Be Venus, a handful of others. Um, I, think that, I think that Ong's a particularly interesting comparison because Ong really exploited the expressive, pushed the expressive possibilities of line as well and attend both attenuated and extended uh lines and i think that a lot of covert's works especially um his nudes um i don't know that he had on in mind but he certainly had in mind uh the academic exercise that that on proposed with the examples of of those works yeah, absolutely. Um, and maybe a good question to close out on, just the, is the identity known of his uh, uh, models? Um, did he have a relationship with them? Anything you could speak to on that? Well, here's what we know. Um, so he, I don't think he did have relationships with any of these people. I think these are, he hires professional models who come in and do work for him. Only he never married. He appeared. He had a girlfriend for many years, who ends up moving to Seattle, but they remain very close. Named Louise Lawler, and she appears in some of these works. Um, another person who appears in, I, I mentioned earlier that the Philadelphia Museum of Art has photographs. He did take photographs of both Louise Arnsberg, a bunch of them, but he also took a lot of pictures of his therapist, a guy named Elmer Ernest Southard. So I don't know what to do with that. Uh, I actually do know, I've actually, I've actually written a little bit about uh, that relationship, but in terms of these women, 
No, we don't know who the, who they are. Um, you know, their aspect. I use the word creepy, and I and I and I and I and I, I, I think you got to call it like you see it. But I also feel like there's also something. Um, I feel like women in these photographs might have. It's hard not to talk about the male gaze. It's hard not to think about the many ways in which women have been written out of the history of art as artists and as subjects. But I feel like he's a little different than other artists, as I was saying before, because the artists are not reduced to a body part. Um, they are allowed to exist in three dimensions in a way that a lot of other artists, especially those showing the nude, do not allow. allow them. Absolutely. Well, um, and I said that was the last one, but a really great question just came in. I think it'll be an easy one. Um, you talked sure. about how you and Michael kind of came to the museum around the same time and had this shared background uh, and that you this is a new gift, um, this collection. I was wondering if you could share approximately how many works by Covert are in the VMFA collection. Um, I wish I could. Um, oh, so, sorry. <laughs> I wish, so they gave us Yellow Mountains and the other painting, uh, a woman um, in a land landscape, they gave us a group of paintings and portraits, a handful of drawings, uh, maybe 16 or 17 items. Then um, in, um, in March of 2020, we purchased um, 39 photographs. That's how many we have. Okay. Great. And they, and they allowed us, I have to say, I, the Arnsberg, a guy named Chuck Arnsberg, uh, I knew his dad who has since passed away. Um, so Chuck Arnsberg would be the great, great, great nephew, maybe the great, no, the great, great, great nephew of uh, Walter Arnsberg. Um, they were really nice. They gave us very organized, they sent us an XLS spreadsheet and they said, some of these we'll give you, some of these, you know, we're gonna sell, uh, we, we, we might sell to you, we might give to others, but they give us some, um, you know, a, a pick, uh, I don't know if it was first dibs, because I know that there are other, many other equally worthy institutions that want to amplify this mo moment. But uh, we have 39 photographs and it was really hard choosing which ones to put in the show, because even though it's called John Covert Dada Photography, it's hard to talk about. I mean, it's not a show about drawing and painting, but unless you contextualize his career with late minimalist drawings and show a painting or two that there are studies for, you're not really telling the John Covert study. So we have a lot, lot of this stuff and you'll be seeing it, especially after the, the expansion, we'll, we'll definitely be rotating this stuff in this material in the museum. That's a very good qu question. Perfect. Um, well, and one to, to end on, and I encourage anyone who is willing to come to the museum, able to, um, the exhibition is wonderful. And the way Leo has paired the photographs with the um, paintings or the studies, uh, it really does tell a story about this artist's process. Um, so thank you, Leo, so much for your time. And uh, with that, Leo, I'll thank you again and uh, sign off.